it's a pretty nice day today. So I'm very much looking forward to waking myself up this morning, and jumping in the river. Welcome to Waterlands, a series brought to you by the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. Are you going to come in? I'm Roxy Furman, a zoologist and filmmaker. My dog, although she's a Labrador, is not much of a swimmer. In this series, I'm exploring the watery places that once covered the land. Oh, it's fresh! Through the stories of people and wildlife that have been shaped by them. Ready, Pippi? In this episode, we're jumping into the river. But all is not well with Britain's rivers. With only 14% found to be in good ecological condition last year. So why are our rivers such a mess? Someone who's been getting to know more about this is Lindsay Cole, swimmer, diver, adventurer. We met Lindsay on the banks of her favourite river, the Avon, just outside the city of Bristol. There's a lot of hoo-ha about swimming outside at the moment because media has branded it as wild swimming and mock it but it it is just incredible because every cell in your body feels and a lot of the time we are numb sometimes comfortably numb and it's an uncomfortable pain sometimes getting into cold water but it really wakes you up and all your senses are alive and then you notice the birds flying over your head or fish popping up from the water and the flowers and you can do it on your own and feel at one with nature or you can do it with a gaggle of friends and squeal and it's free but it's also freeing it's 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 incredible I can't sit down and meditate but my way of meditation is swimming outside but this isn't your ordinary wild swimming story this is about what happened when Lindsay swam the whole length of the Thames and the River Avon she ended up featured in a national newspaper as she learnt firsthand about the effects of water pollution. But before we get to her newspaper story, let's hear how it began. With Lindsay in Indonesia, enjoying the crystal clear waters of the Java Sea, after having spent the day learning to free dive. I um, felt a scratch to my hand. I thought it was a jellyfish, but I saw it was a tiny piece of plastic I was surrounded by loads of little tiny pieces of plastic. It didn't really hurt, hurt, but I've got a scar there. It was really hard hitting to realise how bad the plastic problem is. But it made me think that we're actually just as bad here because we just have this lifestyle where we want our life to be convenient. So we buy things and then throw them away because it's cheap. We weren't actually much better. We just hide the problem better. So Lindsay was moved to do something. She concocted a wild plan. So I thought, what better way than to be a mermaid in the Thames, the most iconic British river. So we had this big six foot mermaid sculpture made out of um, plastic bottles, recycled plastic bottles. And any waste we found, we put into her mouth to show how we're choking our waterways. I called it Urban Mermaid so that people in cities or urban areas can actually think where their waste is going when they discard of it. Dressed as a mermaid, she enlisted a friend to journey alongside her in a canoe that doubled as a rubbish collection facility. Lindsay would swim the whole length of the River Thames, from the source in the Cotswolds all the way to London, via Oxford, Reading, Maidenhead and Windsor. Some places like Reading and Oxford were as badly polluted as I anticipated them to be. But some places were remarkably clean and there was no rubbish at all. Like Maidenhead was remarkably clean and that was down to what I discovered. Initiatives like Plastic Free Communities, I think set up by Surface Against Sewage, where you get people who love their river, whether they're swimmers or kayakers or supporters and they just make a point or hobby of looking after it and cleaning it 
and I really, really noticed. And when I passed Maidenhead and Windsor, the plastic free communities joined me on their SUP boards. As well as being joined along the way by groups of swimming angels, as Lindsay calls them, she also came across something else rather extraordinary. It was just outside Oxford, in a rural countryside. We thought we saw a giant white plastic bag tangled in a tree, and we're pretty sad about that. So my friend Blur canoed up to it to untangle it, and as she got closer, she realised it wasn't a plastic bag at all and that it was actually a brilliant all-white cow. We called the RSPCA and police and they sent six firemen down to pull her out. They wrapped the hose around her. They had to make her swim to the other side where she was met by a vet and then reunited with her calf the next day. We then met a journalist later that day. He asked us what we found in the river and we said plastic bags, balls, dog toys, air mattresses and also a cow. And then the next morning my phone was pinging off the hook because we were on page three of the sun. I think the paper just liked the headline, Mermaid Saves Drowning Cow. If I'd known that's how you got attention for uh, the environment, I would have thought about it earlier. The experience spurred Lindsay on to continue her mermaid journey along another river. So when there was a lot of news last summer about river pollution, I decided to swim my local river, the River Avon, as a mermaid, towing a poo sculpture to highlight the problem of river pollution. Ironically, four days in, I got really ill and was violently sick for 24 hours. I was so ill, but I needed to keep moving. So I got a lift on my canoe support. But it was really enlightening, actually, because I saw all this stinking water gushing out of these pipes along the riverbank. Often it was also discoloured, which means that it was probably not rainwater. So it was a real insight. If it made me sick, could you imagine what it does to the fish and, and the insects? Once recovered, Lindsay got back in the water, swimming to her final destination, Bristol Harbour. Where I was met and surprised by a beautiful gaggle of dancing, brightly coloured, synchronised swimmers. It's a group of retired ladies and they just, they pulled me out of the water and they danced around me and sang a lovely song and it was just the most beautiful ending. Despite all the rubbish and the sickness, Lindsay's journey raising awareness of river pollution was overwhelmingly positive. She made many new friends along the way who swam with her and supported her, and her message was spread far across the UK. Elsewhere, people are solving the problem of river pollution in other ingenious ways. I'm Dan Roberts. I'm the project manager for Nature Based Solutions at Wildfire and Wetland Trust. Biochemist and WWT project manager Dan Roberts is in a very different sort of wetland. With the wind in the reeds, the rustling willow trees and swans flying low overhead, he's at Five Acre Treatment Wetland in Slimbridge, next to one of the farmyards on the WWT reserve. Not only is it a very relaxing place to be, with a range of pools, reed beds and open water bursting with native plants and wildlife, but it's also busily filtering out metals and nitrogen pollutants that come from sewage, agriculture and roads. It's incredible to think that instead of having a concrete building on this plot of land or a water treatment works, we could have a wetland habitat that provides habitat all year round for coots. There's a pair of breeding swans on here in the summer, reed warblers in the summer and diving beetles, frogs and amphibians and reptiles as well. This wetland has been designed to treat wastewater from the farm. So all that slimy agricultural runoff caused by manure, hay and cattle housing is collected at the treatment wetland, where it's then processed naturally through these different wetland pools, travelling on to the local river and canal in a much cleaner condition. But why have our rivers become so polluted? 
Why are we in such desperate need of places like these? Well, before the 1900s, much of Britain was wetlands, full of bogs, fens and meandering rivers. That changed in a big way after the two world wars, when a lot more land was turned over to growing food, and so drainage was carried out on a very large scale. At the same time, as more and more land was taken over for farming, use of pesticides and fertilisers was also becoming increasingly commonplace. All of that created a situation where we have pollutants hurtling at rapid speeds down towards our rivers, many of which had been straightened to become navigable or that had deteriorated over time due to other developments as well. So we've ended up with higher flood risk and in the water that comes down as part of that, higher pollutant loads. All of that having a massive impact on the river ecology, invertebrates and fish populations, and then that having a, a knock-on effect up to fish and birds as well. Then there are other invisible particles too. Chemicals used in everyday life, such as ibuprofen, and other medications also end up in our rivers. These compounds can have severe impacts on wildlife. Fish, in particular, react differently to those chemicals and they can act as hormone inhibitors and can change the balance of male to female fish and that can have an impact on overall abundance of fish. A lot of the sources of pollution nowadays are derived from a variety of sectors and those include wastewater treatment works from water companies, highways, so urban runoff from highways, and then we have agricultural runoff, nutrients, pesticides, and soil or sediment, as well as the manure generated by farmyards running into watercourses as well. There's more. Harmful, forever chemicals. Essentially they're found in flame retardants and the linings of drink cartons and things like that. They can't be meaningfully removed from the environment at all. They accumulate in wildlife and in ourselves. So there's links between concentrations of those compounds in humans and being passed on from mother to a fetus and that having an effect on fertility in the next generation as well. So ultimately there are some very severe, potentially unregulated chemicals finding their way to our water bodies which have a, a serious impact on human health. The full extent to which we're not yet sure because these are unmonitored and therefore it could be much more severe than we, we actually know it to be. Knowing about all this pollution swirling around in our rivers has moved some to a life of campaigning for better water quality. One of these people is Hugo Tagholm, founder of the charity Surfers Against Sewage. I mean, what's most motivational for me is, is surfing with my son who just turned 14 and getting really, really good waves with him as he increases his confidence and capability in the water and, and seeing that happen is a great reward for what, what I feel is you know, my mission around the ocean and environmentalism. Hugo is clear on where much of the problem lies. The lack of investment from, from water companies uh, has been a big driver for a lot of these problems. I mean, this is why we have so many millions of hours of sewage pollution going into our rivers. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done with agriculture to make sure that, that the runoff from fields doesn't end up in our rivers. There's always a question of investment and that uh, an investment is also secured by good regulation and enforcement. And sadly, our regulators have been defunded. Um, over recent decades, we've seen uh, less money available to uh, police companies and these industries. We've seen industries self-reporting and self-regulating to a large extent. And that just leads to um, the problems that we're experiencing today. But reed bed treatment wetlands, like the one Dan's in now, go some way to help the pollution problem. Each stage of the wetland performs a different function in treating the pollutants from the agricultural yard. There are some pretty technical processes happening. Some of it will be degradation by sunlight of pathogens in the upper stages and the settlement of solids from the water column by the slowing of water. And then we go through the rebed matrix. Essentially, the different pools and ponds are consuming pollutants, like what happens naturally in wetlands. As the water travels along the various pools, it's transformed becoming much cleaner than it was before. It's a, it's a microbial factory that thrives off pollutants which would otherwise cause harm to the wider ecosystem. 
now is passed on in a much better condition than it was previously, which ultimately protects the um, the farming business from the impacts of any enforcement by regulators and allows us to create habitat at the same time for, for wildlife. These processes are essentially why wetlands are fantastic. River pollution and all the problems for wildlife that come with it can seem so challenging to deal with as one individual. But there are things that we can all do. We've lost 90% of our wetlands nationally. It's a statistic that's always thrown around, but it can never be underestimated the value of freshwater habitat in an urban setting as well, both for birds that are struggling to find water in summer months, in dry periods, and for harbouring insects and invertebrates over winter as well. A network of urban ponds in people's back gardens would be invaluable to provide stepping stones in between river systems. So how do you create your own wetland habitat? There's many methods to, to create wetlands in your own back garden. Essentially any impermeable container being sunk into the ground. It can be as small as a, an office crate dug into the ground or it can be as large as you can afford it to be. Provide a shallow edge so that wildlife can get in and out if they fall into it and plant it up with native species that are usually locally found or just let it naturally recover and see what species come up because often the hydrology will determine what species ultimately end up liking it in that particular location. I dug one in my own back garden two years ago and the first year afterwards we had five different species of dragonfly and a whole host of other invertebrates and, and plants that we never imagined would come up and it was only one meter wide in a very urban setting so it's really amazing to see how resilient these systems are. Lindsay Cole believes we all have it in us to contribute to change. I think people think the problem is too big and that someone else can deal with it but as I've become aware with plastic or river pollution there's always something that you can do and get involved with. You can litter pick or um, just not use plastic. You can get involved with citizen science so if you've got a local river or waterway that you love and utilise a lot then you can just get citizen science kits and, and test the water and load it up into an app and that information is then shared across the entire world. And it's really exciting for kids and empowering for them to be a part of the solution. And then that information is then sent to the environment agency. Rivers are the veins of the planet. What we put into the rivers ends up into the sea. and. We use rivers more than we realise. It's, it's an entire ecosystem. We just need to become more aware and make noise and lobby the government to do something about it. Waterlands is a series brought to you by the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust. It's an 1860 production and the producer is Eliza Lomas. Head to www.org.uk to find out more. The Five Acre Development is part of the Seven Vale Waterscape, Enhancements for Migratory Fish, a partnership between WWT, Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, Seven Rivers Trust and Stroud Valley's project, with major funding from the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development.